in May last year, I attempted three world records, two that already existed, which was furthest distance on a static bike in one in 12 hours. Twenty-four hours was four hundred and thirty-three miles. Gosh, that sounds really ninja. Where should I aim? And the only thing I could do was aim to be number one. On your marks, get set. Kate, how are you? I'm quite good. Thanks, Chris. Mentally, I'm feeling quite positive, but we were just talking offline about our physical ailments. So there's a few little things going on, but overall, nothing to complain about. Yes, you were saying, uh, um, were the injuries from from your world records? One of the injuries, yes. So uh, obviously sitting on a bicycle for 24 hours, there are five points of contact, and one of which uh, <laughs> chafed quite badly, and I'm still even seven months later healing from that. But the other one is from yoga. I, I took up yoga a few years ago to, to soften and sort of give back to my body, and that's where I tore a la my labrum in my hip. Oh my gosh, that sounds painful. Which, which part of your hip is that? Uh, it's it's my anterior labrum. So I was sort of bending backwards in one of those uh, abnormal yoga positions that I should have known better and something snapped. And ever since then, I've been in pain running. I, um, yeah, I'm sitting and walking, but I've managed to get it to a point where I can run two and a half K and obviously cycle, but I'm not going to push it any further. Just um, There's no more need. Yeah, an injury, it's just the nemesis, isn't it, of people that like to exercise a, a, a lot. And it doesn't, uh, it, to be honest, it, it doesn't really affect me. I, I've been really lucky injury-wise, but it's my my back. I think, had I known what I know now, Kate, I would have looked after my back over the years a lot better than I have. Yeah. And I've put my disc out put a disc out this time, lift in the garden shed, stupid thing to do. But my mind, I still think that I'm 18. Yeah. <laughs> I still feel 18. So I think, oh, I'll just, I'll just, and, and, it, and it's, um, gosh, and, and for someone who's had a slip disc operation or a discectomy, mm -hmm. it, 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 it's, you were talking like two years out of your life where you wait and get all this stuff sorted out. So, Anyway, not here to talk about my, my back. Can you, Kate, can you tell us more about your world records and how did they come about? Yeah, so in May last year, I attempted three world records, two that already existed, which was furthest distance on a static bike in one in 12 hours. But the big one that I was really excited about and nervous was furthest distance in 24 hours. Uh, and the reason why I was quite excited is because there was a there was a male equivalent world record, but no female. And it was sort of my nod to making sure that we we do our best positively towards equity and, and equalizing opportunity for all as well. Mm. And oh, do you do that on a track or is that in, in the nature or something? It was actually on a static bike. So I, I fixed I, I've got a bamboo bicycle made in Ghana. So it's, it was fixed on a sort of indoor training wheel, if you want. And so I didn't move. It was on a full moon uh, night. So I was outdoors. So at least I got a bit of nature. But yeah, things were moving around me, but I was pretty stationary for the entire time. Gosh, that sounds really ninja. <laughs> it was quite brutal. <laughs> yeah. Do you, I'm guessing you have to sort of pace yourself a bit. Yeah, I mean, I, I decided to do this record in 2020. And as I'm sure... I'm not alone here that that year proved to never follow anyone's plans. Uh, and so indoor training was actually, I was quite fortuitous to have a lot more time on my hands to do the training I needed to. And the time kept getting moved back. So I originally wanted to complete it in 11 months, uh, but lockdowns and restrictions meant I had 16 months to, to train for it. Um, but yeah, it was it was it was mentally a lot to prepare for. Uh, but for the day, as you said, it was just making sure that I didn't burn out at the beginning. But I still was breaking the world records for the one in twelve hours first. 
and finding out how my body could digest the food. I mean, there's all this sort of elements I'd never even thought about, but my stomach wasn't digesting after eight hours because it was focusing so hard on my legs. So I needed a massage just to be able to move things from my tummy into its intestines to do the work. Um, but yeah, it was it was quite an exploration of how the body works for 24 hours. Mm. What were you doing in Ghana? I, I haven't been to Ghana. I just found a charity that uh, makes bicycles out of bamboo. And I love that it's a carbon positive product. Uh, and she also, the charity founder, she also makes bicycles for local kids. They can attend schools. So it was just a really nice added story to to what I was cycling on, that we gave some care and attention and made sure that it was as sustainable as possible. Have yeah, you been I've to heard... Africa at all? Yes, I've been, um, gosh, um, several times actually, but I, I worked in Mozambique for six months um, teaching street kids. I'd heard about this bike. Um, I think didn't the chap who's done did the first triathlon up and down the UK um, was his name Sean? Yeah, Conway. Sean Conway. Yeah, didn't he do his cycle on a bamboo yeah. bike? Or... Yeah, he did a bamboo bike as well. So it's 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 great to see more and more people sort of looking at alternative uh, materials. Yeah. How how do they? I mean, how do the sort of finer points work like the brakes and the rims and the inner tubes or or, or tires all of, all of that is normal so the the gearing the the pedals even the handlebars all of that is what you'd expect on a normal bike mm. but it's, it's the actual frame the core of it that is made of bamboo uh so we send the spec over and they cut the bamboo to order they then strap it together with hemp and then pour resin over it to just sort of make sure nothing falls apart. And it's as strong as steel. Uh, it's a little bit heavier than steel. Uh, and we've got to use disc brakes. So that's the only sort of downside because of the weight issues. But everything else is really high spec, which is absolutely amazing for um, cyclists who need that sort of attention as well. Yeah, I'd say don't leave it near a panda bear. <laughs> Luckily, there aren't that many in Britain, so we should be fine. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you get into? I mean, you, you, I, I see you. You're a Reiki specialist or practitioner, um, but you came from an aerospace back background, so that's an interesting crossover. Yeah, I think. Um, when I when you know when we're told to choose our life at the age of seventeen, we don't really know how to answer that question. So I liked maths, I liked geography, I liked languages. So I chose environmental engineering as my one of my first degrees. Uh, you're right, I did go on to aerospace, uh, but it it was done a little bit flippantly. Uh, I, I and I chose to study abroad, so I studied in France and Italy. So I was able to at least get my travel fix from that. But I think looking back, I was never, I'm not an engineer. I, I'm good with maths and numbers, but it doesn't mean that I'm that sort of tolerance and fit in the engineering box. I'm very much more intuitive and spiritual and follow my gut and just do things on a whim. So uh, now at the age, beautiful age of 40, I'm rediscovering myself and following what makes my heart sing rather than what the logic dictates I should be doing because I'm good at or my parents expect it from me. So, yeah. Uh, it's good to yes. see the evolution myself at last. <laughs> yes, we have to shape, throw off the conditioning, don't we? And and start to live life for ourselves and do what makes you happy, they say. Yeah, and um, it's it's a blessing. I don't, I don't know if you're noticing it in your in your sort of where you sort of network, but or hang out. I'm seeing more and more people at an earlier age have these questions of, you know, what what do I enjoy? You know, how can I do something that that makes, you know, as I said, makes my heart sing, but I really have passion for rather than just looking for the money. Uh, so I'm really heartened to see more and more people having that conversation earlier on. Yeah, I, I was on a campsite in. Um, I think it was Airlie Beach or it was somewhere up near Cairns in, in Australia and the chap I got 
friendly with a chap who was putting his tent up next to me. So we had a barbecue that evening and stuff. And by the end of the night, he was in bits. He was actually sobbing his heart out because he said, Chris, all my life, I've just chased the job. I thought it was about the career position. I thought it was about the money. And if I stick at it, I'll be this. And he says, I've just wait, wasted my 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 life. For anyone listening, no, you haven't wait, ever wasted your life. It's all experience, but <laughs> this is this is this guy's anecdote. And um and uh yeah, it's kind of funny. My mates rode across the Atlantic and he looks at me and goes, Chris, you've lived hell of a life. <laughs> what you're about, <laughs> you haven't done badly yourself. Um yeah. Yes, freedom, freedom, throw off the shackles. So let's um, go back a, a bit, Kate. Ha, have you always been a fitness type person or an exercise person, or was this something that came to you later in life? I think this iterum of my life started about 10 years ago. So I've always been fit in school. Like, again, the belief my parents gave me was that I, my family were, were the, fit, the physical fitness family rather than the arty or the cultural family. So uh, I fitted that model, but I never took any sport seriously. So I was called up to Wales in lacrosse, for example, and I said no, because I didn't want to take the joy out of what I enjoyed. And every time they'd sit me down and say, you, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that. And that's when I said, I don't want to stop myself. So uh, it was only in 2012 when uh, I went through quite a toxic relationship. It broke down, fortunately, six days before our wedding, but it left me really questioning, similar to what you said with that guy on Ely Beach, like, who am I? What have I been doing for the last year? So, you know, where, where is me on that list? You know, I'm doing all this for work, all this for the other person. Just, you know, the, the dog was getting more attention than I was. So uh, that's when I decided to, put me back on the list. And I always find sport is a really humbling experience because we can't hide from it. We can't lie that we've done our work because we'll be in a world of pain after you know, a training session or a, a race if we haven't. Uh, but it's also quite liberating because it just started to build myself up in confidence as well as um, connecting myself to nature again because I was running in the Blue Mountains. I lived in Australia at the time. So it was just a great way for me to sort of build up that integrity and put myself first as well with, with permission using that sport as a vehicle. We've got to say hello to Bob at this point then, because Bob's one of the guys on my team and he lives in the Blue Mountains. Amazing. Hi, Bob. Yes. Is it the two sisters or something, the seven sisters? The, there's the three, three sisters. Them, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I lived very close to there, actually, in a place called Blackheath. The village of 2000. Yeah, I was in one of those towns very near to the, the Three Sisters and um, there was a bushfire mm. and it's just smoke everywhere. <laughs> and uh, I stopped for a bit to have a look, but I was quite pleased to get back in my hire car and and bug out of there. Yeah, um, yes. Yeah, it's, it's very, it's very wild. And we forget sometimes, live, well, I live in Britain now, and we forget how wild wild is, you know? So, yeah. I, it, it's lovely. I love the vibe down there. So many people get up early for exercise, don't they? Mm. Yeah. Know, it's, we don't meet in a pub. We meet on a walk. And what a great way to live. Yeah, you'll see, you know, two guys, I don't know, my age, 50 years old, carrying a, canoe down to the sea to have their morning paddle and all the surfers in the water and mm. do, do you find are you like me Kate do you find life's a bit more fun when it's sunny oh yeah yeah definitely yeah I find it I have to really kind of speak to myself in a good way in the winter <laughs> and and yeah. uh, do um um almost like NLP on myself to, to remind myself all the seasons are beautiful, Chris, not just the summer, but yeah, but uh, yeah. I do, 
I am passionate about. The summer just fills me with so much energy. I completely agree. I, I think I'm hibernating. I think I hibernate in winter. I need to halve my to-do list. I need to sleep more. I need to, you know, eat more as well and just sort of find a duvet and just lay under it for a bit longer. Yes. Yes. I have to be really strict because um, somebody said to me at the end of last summer, I hope you're going to do your running videos every day when it's freezing cold in the winter. So I got no choice but to get up at five or six and jog around the block. Um, but uh, braver man than me. <laughs> oh, I, I, I really love it. I absolutely love it. I love my life. Yeah, I mm. love. I love life. I should say, and um, being able to get up when it's bitterly cold and everything's icy and and put your running gear on and still love it whereas i don't know 20 years i wouldn't have been like that 20 years ago i certainly wasn't like it in, when i was in the marines i used to hate the cold <laughs> it's, it's not not good when you're in the norwegian arctic but it was it's awful shouldn't make soldiers get cold no it doesn't make sense at all <laughs> um Yes. So did you completely transit from the aerospace stuff into into what you do now? Because you're a public speaker, you're a life coach, you you help um, businesses get their act together and 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 you you know you you do the Reiki, you do you do a lot of stuff, Kate, and it's all really good. Have you moved completely away from the air? Yeah, I have. I have. I, last year, I did have some clients who still worked in the aerospace sector, but it wasn't about the engineering aspect. It was more about them finding their vision and their purpose and different ways of serving their clients in a more altruistic way. They found that how they were working didn't fit their personal beliefs and they wanted to upgrade. So it's still working the way I want it, just in my old sector. But yeah, I I got out of it after two years, actually, the engineering. Yeah, I mean, it's a funny sector because, I mean, British aerospace, um, for example, I mean, they make lots of weapons, don't don't they? They make lots of arms. Mm, yeah. And, it, it's predominantly military and mm. defence. And unfortunately, defence sometimes means attack as well. So it isn't all just flying to the Caribbean to have a nice holiday. There is sort of side to it that I wasn't enjoying as much the more I got to know it. Yeah, it's a funny old industry. You, I mean, working in Mozambique, you still can't go off the track because there's land, landmines all over the mm. country. And to think someone made that in a factory and someone designed it, really so cognitively distanced from what it actually what the function of it actually is, is, um, yeah. So let's go back to your world records. So you did the 12 hour one and the 24 in one go. You just, when you got to the 12 hour mark, you'd got that record. What, what distance did you, what distance was that? And what distance did you get overall? So the one hour I've got them written, I can't remember that they're written behind me. Fortunately, the 12 hour was, uh, 232 miles. 332. Two, 232 miles. 232 miles in 12 hours. My God. Yeah. And then the 24 hours was 433 miles. So I obviously was getting slower in the last 12 hours. Not much slower. Oh, Kate, that's incredible effort. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you. Well, I remember when I I um I decided to do a quadruple Ironman distance triathlon, mm -hmm. and I did it over seven days. And when I did the bike phase, I think the first evening I knocked off after swimming for ten miles. I did thirty six miles on the bike just to get that, like yeah, the the odd. 36 because then it meant 100 miles per day for the next was it four four days i think it was oh um gosh. and i was getting up at dawn 
And I was still going late at night just to get a hundred miles in per day. And I'm a mm-hmm. rubbish cycler. I mean, I did, I think I cycled 25 miles training, training for that. Um, but it still, it took me 12 hours to just scrape a hundred miles. Um, yeah. But you had like a full marathons waiting for you. So I totally get why you were taking your time. Yeah. Yeah. 108 miles I had to run in the end because of, the trail was so badly. I, 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 I'd put in for an ultra to do the run in an ultra, if that makes sense. And it's the Robin Hood ultra up in Sherwood Forest in Nottingham. Wonderful ultra. If anyone's um, listening, it starts off down a canal bank, about 12 miles along this beautiful canal. Then it's just all around Sherwood Forest. But um, come the next day, oh my God, I was in bits. Couldn't feel my feet because my spine had been so crushed. Um, um, yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. Wow. It yes, begs the th- question. Do you get often the question, like people asking you why, why you do it? Um, n- no. Um, my kind of thing I almost said frustration, but that's that's not really true. Is I, when people say, "Oh, how do you run a length of the country?" I say it's really simple. You buy an aeroplane ticket, you get out at John O'Groats, and then you look at your compass, and if it says south, then you start putting one foot in front of the other. If you can put a tent up, that's a double bonus because you'll have to get a hotel. In anyone tells me they can't do what I just said. It, you know, and if you're in a wheelchair, you got to, you know, do some wheeling. Um, it's yeah. that simple. It, it, it's within ev- everyone. I I didn't do any training to run the length of the country because I that was <laughs> that was the first time I um, had a, a disc operation. So I'd been pretty much disabled for two years, and finally, having put this thing off and put it off and put it off, and then finally got an operation then i had to i think i had about four surgical procedures in total and finally i'm just thought i've got to get this done so i just bought (laughs) bought bought a plane ticket and um yeah just went to john O'Groats and started it and just smiled all all the way and and i mean you do get a few challenges i'm not gonna i'm not gonna kid you but um it's just weird, Kate. It's that thing, isn't it? I grew up in a generation where the media wanted you to believe that that like a half marathon is the preserve of the Olympic elite. And, you yeah. know, and it's for these people that have trained like really hard and da, 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 da. and it's it's like I hate to disillusion people. You can walk a half marathon really easy. <laughs> Yeah, maybe not. You know, I, I get everyone's got different levels of uh, um, uh, ability. I'm I'm not being too flippant, but seriously, if somebody put a gun to your head and said, "If you don't walk 13 miles, I will shoot you," you you you're going to walk 13 miles, and then you're going to go, "Oh, wasn't actually that difficult." So yeah. that's my that's my kind of thing. Is I'm more I I I I don't want to be one of these athletes that makes out i'm super special and that i'm elite or i've done all this training or you couldn't do i tell people the truth plant-based diet that puts you way ahead of of most people in life not not just in um not just in sport and when i I, i'm what i call majority plant-based kate so I don't mind to eat a bit of meat. I've, I've made a thing now. I don't eat factory meat, so I'll only eat game meat, which is, I don't know, possibly one, once a week these days. But um, I'd rather people sort of understood this side of it, you know, how we've been massively lied to about our, our, our diet, um, how we've been lied to about, you know, sports that they're not, not as elitist yeah. as, as you might think you get very um you know very i chatted to a guy the other day rich 
um, his podcast is going to come out soon. He shed, God knows, uh, 10 stone in a year to run Britain's toughest 100 mile ultra going up, up and down mountains. And he did all that in a year. So, and he lost 10 stone from being chronically obese to do it. So, no one's really got an excuse if they, if someone like Rich can do that. Yeah, I completely agree. And, you know, what you're saying is, is really, it resonates me with what I do my best to share as well as I am just a normal girl who, who has, you know, didn't put one foot in front of the other, just put one pedal in front of the other. Mm. And it hurts. Uh, I live streamed it all to make sure people saw the pain. Like for, for 16 hours, I did not smile. I was crying. You know, there was blood, sweat and tears everywhere. But we just do it because we, we made a promise. And, and I know that it, it pushes me to be more, to be more Kate, to, you know, and hopefully inspires others to just do more as well. And as you, as you said, it's all on a plant-based diet as well. So at least I knew that what I was eating was helping me nourish and keeping me alive as well and, and others as well making sure my impact to the environment was less what did you eat kate when you were on on the bike um i used um my favorite go-to meal was a taco dal so i made my own lentil curry with brown rice uh, and also i used some bars and natural sort of natural gels that are made out of beetroot juice from this company called Velo forte so it's all it's all whole food. So I, I look at the ingredients list and I actually recognize the names. Uh, so that's a really big thing for me. Uh, so that's all I ate pretty much. About a dozen bars, a couple of bowls of taco dal and some drinks to make sure I stayed hydrated. Oh, that's great. When I've run ultras, the thing I hate about them is when you stop at the, the I don't know, what, aid stations they call them, don't they? You stop at an mm. aid station. It's all bloody sweets. It's yeah. the last thing you want to eat when you've been running for 75 miles is a bowl. Of, I mean, yeah, there is a place. Sometimes you just want to grab some jelly babies and shove them in your mouth and that sugar. It's just good. But but most of the time you want some proper food, don't you? You want some. Yeah. Yeah. I used to make my own when I lived in Australia, like little rice balls. Uh, or I used to make some like dates, you know, sweet and sour, basically. Just make sure I, I didn't saturate my, my palate. But yeah, we, I don't know why we turn to all of this processed junk because it's not helping us. It's giving us a quick rush and sugar mm. and we're justifying it because we're running or cycling or whatever far, but it really isn't good. So yeah, let's just turn back to the nature. Yeah, and I heard, sorry to turn this to, to running, it's just I don't get on my bike as much as I should, but now my back's hurt and I probably will because, sorry, I'm really going off on one here, but. I've never been able to touch my toes, Kate, right? I can't get much past my knees, if I was honest. In Marines training, you have to be able to touch your toes, but I used to just fake it. And just luckily, in, in eight months of training, the, the, the physical training instructor never noticed that I couldn't touch my toes, so I got, I got away with it. With one exception, when I got off that bike after 400 miles, I touch my toes easily. Oh my god! How mad is that? That's strange. <laughs> yeah, it must have must have just shaken my back out. Oh, you know, just that posture must have just been. So I think now my back's hurting again. I'm gonna get 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 my nice um road bike out and go and do some miles. But yeah, that's what I was gonna say. I saw a guy on the Joe Rogan show. Can't remember the chap's name, but he's one of the world's leading ultra runners now. And I all. I already knew that Scott Jurek, who's one of the most famous ultra runners in the world, was completely plant-based. Mm -hmm. And this chap on Joe Rogan's show, he, he ran, runs in ketosis. So yeah. he just eats, uh, what's the name of the ketosis diet? Is it like a paleo sort of? Yeah, it's pro high protein, low or no carbs, I think. Yeah, high so he keeps his body burning fat so that when he goes into an ultra, his body's not slowed down because it's trying to digest a whole load of stuff. It's already onto the fat. So there's no 
like the glucose uh, reserve. He hasn't got to burn through that first. He's so he's already on the already burning his body's fat. And I found that was that's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've started to look into that and also about fasting. And we can do it on a plant-based diet because there's a myth that paleo is only meat, mm. uh, but it just means a lot of avocados. Uh, but yeah, just to be able to transition, as you said, from carb to fat is is really helpful, especially if we're going over longer distances. Mm. I find, because um, I fat, well, I just tend to have a green smoothie at lunchtime. So basically a pint of vegetables and one meal in the evening and if i'm running as well which i do every day i i start to taste the ketosis um you know so my body's almost in that state but, but i guess i'm not putting in loads of reserve calories so my body's storing it up and up and up i'm just right on that line so i i, I can feel you for friends at home that are wondering how you tell you your mouth starts to taste soapy and that's the fat, the fat as it burns off, you get this, um, cause you can make soap from fat, can't you? In fact, it's, yeah. it's yeah. um, I think that was in that film fight club. They, he used to go and raid all the liposuction places for bin bags full of fat people's fat. And then he used to turn it into this luxury soap. Uh, but, uh, yeah. So, Going back to the bike then, so you're on the bike, what kind of pace are you having to keep up? So for the first for the first hour, because that was a world record as well, uh, I have I did just over 24 miles an hour. So nothing massive, but but enough just to make sure that the record was succeeded. Uh, and then thereafter, I'm quite a slow cadence. So my, I don't turn my legs very quickly. So it was around 70 to 80 revs a minute. And it varied between like 22 to 18 miles an hour, uh, depending on my pain thresholds and, and what the target was for that hour. Luckily, I've got a team around me to make those kind of decisions. Because I didn't, if I think too far forward, like it can overwhelm me or it can feel insurmountable or I can push too hard. So they only gave me a number to focus on for 60 minutes. And that was what I just needed to do. And then the next 60 minutes, they, they changed the number. So I knew what I was aiming for that one. And you said there was no previous women's record for the 24 hour one. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So did you have a rough idea what you wanted to achieve? Yeah. I mean, Guinness chose a number out, well, basically out of thin air and they said, a 400, I think it was 420 miles for for the 24 hours. So I knew it had to be over that to be able to achieve the record. But I hadn't ridden the bike before. It was I'd only, I only got it the week before, so I'd only done one hour training on it. Uh, I'd never cycled outdoors before. It, it, there was a lot of variables. So for me, it was just happy to, to finish it. Uh, so, yeah, anything over 420 was an absolute bonus. The goal was to finish 24 hours. Mm. <laughs> And and sorry, just remind us again, you did 433.1. Wow. <laughs> and um what when you got off the bike, was, did you have any ritual? Was there anything you were really massively looking forward to? Uh I I don't actually. I make sure I I'm I'm a bit strange, maybe. I, I train with no pleasure. So I don't watch Netflix. I don't listen to music. I, I used to train facing a brick wall uh, just and in my triathlon era before that. I train with no padding in my, my trousers either because anything above that was always luxury. And the same for after the event. Uh, I don't set myself up to have that expectation. So I just said thank you to my team, uh, helped the pack down and, and had a cold bath. It's very, very basic, very simple pleasures. <laughs> yes, you, you've got to be strict with that cold bath, haven't you? And and because it, all I feel like is a nice hot bath, but of course it's oh. it's it's the worst thing. I. It's amazing the differences that a cold bath or a cold shower has. Mm, I had one this morning. I actually had a cold bath, 
at least up to like my chest height just to try to get my back the disc in my back to shrink mm. a bit or the swelling to to shrink but when i ran the length of the country someone very kindly bought me the land's end hotel for the night for me and my my family and um i was trying to drink a pint in the pub but i was so exhausted i couldn't function couldn't speak everyone was trying to say oh chris can i help you and i'm just like fuck off I don't just just <laughs> leave me alone no you can't help i've been fine for 37 days doing everything on my own every minute of the day and now suddenly all these people it was a bit it was a bit of a strange scenario and um and i went up to that hotel room and i i just couldn't resist a nice hot bath and the next day i couldn't walk Oh, gosh. Well, yeah. I did walk, but it was like I was like uh, walking like John Wayne. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. So, so uh, and tell us about triathlon, Kate, because I'm I noticed that in your resume. Um, I'm always fascinated about triathlon because it's something I I came to really late in life, mm. and I'm really. <laughs> Not right. done the levels of you. I've I've done three Ironmen in my life, uh, and I just turned to it when I went through that breakup. And it was nine years prior. I started training for an Ironman, but I got talked out of it by my then boyfriend. You know, you, you know, don't do that. You know, I'll miss you when you go training. All of this sort of lovey dovey words, but actually, it's slightly controlling and, and negative and behind it. And I didn't pick up on it. So yeah. Just wanted to put myself back on my list. So I set myself a goal of completing an Ironman. Uh, and similar to what you're saying about flying, if you want to walk Land's End to John O'Groats, just fly to Land's End and start walking. I thought, if I want to do an Ironman, and I've never done one before, where should I aim? And the only thing I could do was aim to be number one. And it wasn't out of ego. It wasn't out of beating anyone or proving something to somebody it was well if I don't aim at first I'll never find out how far I can go so that was my goal I could barely run a mile but I was saying to my friends I'm going to be an Ironman world champion and <laughs> I never did but I became long distance world champion so I found my level but I, I know in my heart I would never have got there had I set a goal of just finishing so yeah, that's it. Was just a way of again reclaiming part of my life and giving me permission to dream again. Did you, did you actually end up doing an Ironman? Yeah, I, I, I did three in a year. So I was, I went pretty gun ho at it. Uh, the closest I got to it was tenth, I think, uh, with a three forty five marathon at the end. So pretty good, but just not not good enough but that was my level that was where i finished it's only not good enough if you're comparing yourself to other people <laughs> okay come on yeah true exactly exactly and i'm still doing it look at me i'm saying that i didn't uh yeah yeah for our friends out there i came my first ever triathlon was in in a place called torquay in devon or torbay area i didn't just come last i was so much behind the whole field that my little boy was on the finish line going, where's my daddy? Why is my daddy not come back yet? I was honestly like the best part of an hour behind. They tried to stop me. They, they asked me to stop. So sir, like we're trying to pack it. I'm like out of my face. If you want your medal, you can keep it. I don't, I'm not stopping. Right. <laughs> and, and they were very graciously wet, waited around and then put my, put my medal on them. Oh. But, but, uh, and that was your, do they call it like the standard triathlon? So it's like a half Ironman or, or, or it's a mile swim. I don't know, is it 40 mile bike ride and, and then a six mile run or some, something like this. Um, and when I come over that finish line, I thought, right, in eight weeks time, I'll do four Ironmen together. <laughs> or, or I should say distance triathlon. I did the swim in a in a in a in a Lido pool, so a salt water swimming pool. But um but uh yeah it, I just think it's impressive that you've done an Iron Man. Um yeah it, and it's so inspiring. 
it's scary, isn't it, when we set goals like that? And it's not just our own fears, it's the naysayers around us that, oh, you can't do that. Who do you think you are? You can't run this distance. It, it's tough to stand strong and, and say, I'm going to do an Ironman. So, yeah, well done you as well. Mm. Yeah, this is a thing, again, that we have to be careful of is you can have some really keen sportsmen or whatever it is in life telling you or, or authors, because, you know, I've write, written a few books telling you, oh, da, 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 and, and what they're doing is they're projecting their own stuff on onto you. It's not real. Like the number yeah. of people when you join the Marines will tell you you can't do it. Um. And when you get in the Marines, it's really weird. Some of the guys you think will get through this tough training. No, they're like the first guys to leave. And right. the underdogs that are just, I mean, I was like nine and a half stone or something. Um, get through to the end. It's, um, mm. so I never listen to naysayers ever. I, I just set my own course and think, right, I think I can do this. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah. And having a partner that supports you is, I mean, I probably shouldn't say this, but I will. If you haven't got a partner that supports you, then they're not your partner. I um, agree. I, I totally agree. If they're not, if they're not enrolled in your potential and your dreams, they are not enrolled in you and they, they're holding you back. And that is not love in my world. Yeah. If they love you, they want you to blossom, don't they? And um mm. When our little boy was born, I remember running out of the hospital. We couldn't wait to leave the hospital and get home. And we we walked him through the door and I said, Jane, can I go for a run? She went, go. <laughs> so I went and ran a marathon. I left Amazing. her alone with our little, our little bundle of joy for four and a half hours. And she was more than happy with that. But, you know, how many people were like, oh, you can't can't what well, now you've just got your baby home ah mm. yeah yeah i owe my um i owe my girlfriend an awful awful lot she's just brilliant yeah so kate what's the future what what a great question uh who knows mm. but in honesty i've i've met somebody who actually supports me for the first time in my life a couple of years ago and what's wonderful is I've, I've shared what I wanted to do and he asked if you could come as well. So later this year, we're cycling around Wales on our both our bamboo bikes around the circumference of Wales, raising some money for a mental health charity. But next year is a biggie. So we're cycling the circumference of England, Scotland and Wales, 3,000 miles. And we're planting 3,000 trees as we go because obviously the bike ride isn't enough. And uh, yeah. It's just amazing that for the first time in my life, I've got someone who doesn't begrudgingly let me go. They also want to be part of it and actively involved. So really looking yeah. forward to it. Yes. Sorry, the point of what I was saying, folks, was, yeah, you, you life's too short to have someone that doesn't 100% get behind what, mm -hmm. what you want to do, isn't it? Kate, that's an amazing challenge. How can people follow you support you get involved sponsor you what, whatever yeah i've set up a page on my my main website uh where there's the donate button as well to give for the just giving pages and it's katestrong.global slash adventures and there you can find out about the tour de wales as well as the challenge 3000 which i've aptly named for the 2023 challenge yeah we'll put all your links below the um below our youtube video so everyone can get on it um it's it, i don't know if you're sick of talking about it but you've got a wicked surname for this kind of thing haven't you yeah well i mean it's a double-edged sword because i've got a lot to live up to but i'm learning that vulnerability is also a strength as well yes i guess it depends what kind of strong doesn't it because um you wouldn't want to smell strong. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but no, it's like we had, we had a, guy, a guy I worked with in the Marines was called Armstrong. <laughs> That's quite quite a good, good name. I guess that comes from the old 
English archery or something, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. We've got ties to some some lands, like common law lands, with the, we, where a battle was won and we got rights to allow our horses to live on it or something. Obviously, I have hundreds of horses that live there, not one. Uh, so, yeah, I think our name comes from that as well. And when you're doing your cycle, are you are you going to be camping? Are you back yeah. uh, camping? Yeah, camping. Uh, if if anyone's got a spare room, I'm very happy to obviously grab a shower and and sleep on a on a bed or a sofa or the floor. But predominantly camping. Yeah, you'll be inundated. Um, it's a real reminder what absolutely lovely people there are in this great nation. Yeah. Um, you can sometimes forget that when you see all the nonsense. Well, I haven't watched TV for a long time, but you know, yeah, that <laughs> that mainstream media thing makes out it's a terrible world. Um, you'll get lots of people that will want want to look after you all all the way. Doesn't mean the cycling's any easier, but no. And yeah. how 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 are you gonna? plant these trees what are they, are they saplings or are they going to be actual acorns or something i i'm um i know it we're not going to carry them with us which is quite handy because to cycle with 3000 trees is a feat in itself uh I, i'm looking for partners in different communities that we're passing through so that we can plant them together like a hundred trees together uh so the community can then look after it so i think they will already be like saplings or mature mm. trees but yeah we can we can do it as, as we go along and i'd love to also stop at remote villages and schools to be able to talk to the children because i'm not sure they get that many adventurers who pass their way so it would be really great to connect to those schools and communities and hear about what they're up to as well so yeah it's yes. a really community driven challenge are you looking for volunteers to help you with that part uh, yeah, any type of help because it is just me and my my partner doing it all at the moment, and we obviously have full time jobs, and this is this is our give back. So yeah, anyone who's got any ideas or connections, uh, please reach out or ideas to make sure that we're you know we do it as honestly or carbon neutrally as possible. Then yeah, get in touch. Happy to hear. Happy to chat. And Kate, one last thing: can we talk about the Reiki? Reiki, or do I pronounce it right? Yeah, yeah. Um, what what would you like to talk about it? Well, it's an incredible thing. So, apologise that a good part of this podcast have been talking about my poor old back, but I I have suffered with it over the years. I had a motorbike once, and going over the speed bumps that they become a big thing in our city a while back. They put speed bumps everywhere. Mm. It compressed the disc and I had this painful back for ages and ages and ages. And I went round to my friend Mike's. Hello, Mike, if you if you're watching. And um he said, Right, come here, Chris. And he just put his hand like this. And he said, Is that better? And I went, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, of course it 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 wasn't better. And then as I went out of his house to get on my bike, I realized the pain was just completely gone. Something that had been troubling me for about six weeks was completely gone. And I'm, I'm fast fascinated. I mean, I am in the right area. That is Reiki. Am, am, am yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't sort of portray to heal things because I offer the energy to your he inner healer and it heals emotionally or physically what you need. But yeah, pretty much. Um, I suppose for anyone who doesn't even know what Reiki is, it's, it's a way of, it's like charging your phone. You, we are the phone, the mobile phone, but we sometimes don't know how to connect to the electricity. So the Reiki is just the, the cable that connects into the phone and allows universal energy or healing energy to pass into us. Uh, and as a Reiki practitioner, I'm able to sort of channel that energy or you know, direct that energy into the person, into the area that they need the healing. So that's how I describe it. But it's absolutely magical in, in no words. 
no short words of that. Yes, and again, it's an area we've all we've been cut off from. Mm. Um, understanding we're all part of this wonderful universe, prim- primarily, and we're this individual body, secondly, um, and that there is a universal energy running through all things, and that that energy can get blocked. Is is there anything? What would you recommend people do on a day to day basis to to keep this energy flowing yeah well one one is connect to nature preferably without shoes so just standing on a bit of lawn or touching the bark of a tree that will start reconnecting and sort of bubbling up our own energy energy or you know the universe energy loves movement so vibrate your cells go for a run do star jumps jog on the spot uh start moving at the higher end, like cellular frequency. Uh, And also what I love doing is I have a gratitude journal, but I also add onto it curiosity, start seeing the world anew. I think we're getting a lot, like we might walk the same path to work or whatever. And we, we just sort of go into our zone and forget that outside the real world and magic's happening. So start looking for that magic every single moment and every single day. Those three simple steps can really help us start reconnecting to the energy that is surrounding us all and that we are actually part of as well. And I've heard that stress can quite block this energy. Yeah, anger, worry, anything that, you know, it's a lower frequency, anything that sort of darkens our days. Mm. Uh, And saying, don't be angry or don't be stressed doesn't help letting it pass because what we resist persists so if we are stressed honor the stress it's okay to be stressed it means that we we're you know concerned about something find out how we can release it healthily rather than just suppressing or ignoring it brilliant advice kate you've been absolutely wonderful Um, likewise yeah i hope we can cycle somewhere together at some point you'll yeah, have to pass you at some point yeah. i'm sure <laughs> you'll, you'll have to wait for me though uh, i will make sure you're at the end of it but i'll be you'll be dry you'll be dragging me along for sure yes well on, on you know well, well keep i'll keep up to speed with your big cycle and i'll get my bike out when you get down to sunny devon um yeah. it w- would be great to see you so stay on the line so i can thank you properly but absolutely what a wonderful guest friends at home um i hope you got as much from this as as i did i think i'm in that grand old stage of life now i just appreciate the nice energy in things and and it's where i like to be and um so kate thank you ever ever so much for that friends if you can uh yes virtual hug (laughs) Friends at home, one for you two. Massive love to you all. Please look after yourselves. Please turn off your mainstream media and, and go and do some something that invests in, in, in the positive you. If you can like and subscribe, that would be wonderful. And we'll see you next time.